Well, I invite you to turn in your scripture to the Gospel of Mark, and as you turn there, children, you are invited to head on down to kids' worship and uh, learn about Jesus downstairs. And for the rest of us, I just have a question out of curiosity, and it will make itself more clear as to why I'm asking this sort of midway through the sermon. But how many of you brought, you have a copy of the scripture with you this morning? You brought it to church either? Okay, good. Um, How many of you have an English Standard Version, the version that we preach? Oh, good. Okay. NIV, New International. All right. That's what I thought. Uh, Any others? Uh, Just raise your hand. Okay. Now I'm curious. Uh, NKJV? NASB? CSB? Okay. (laughs) A little bit of everything. Good stuff. It's like the buffet of Bibles up in here this morning. All right, good. That will become apparent uh, in a moment as we get through, but it's helpful for me to know uh, because I'm going to be preaching from the English Standard, but we're going to look at a particular thing in the NIV here in a moment. This morning, we're looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 40. We're going to go all all the way uh, to chapter 2, verse 12. But before I read that passage, I want to read for you two verses from Leviticus 13 uh, before I begin our reading in Mark this morning. This is Leviticus 13, starting in verse 45. Moses writes these words, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So keep those words in your mind as I read for us from Mark 1, starting in verse 40. This is God's word to us. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places And people were coming to him from every quarter. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise. Pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray. 
Father, as we look at these two stories, these two true stories, these accounts of Jesus' life, we pray that you would help us to love him more and that the Holy Spirit would teach us to place our full trust in him. We pray these things in his name. Amen. I've wondered if you have been listening to the messages that are being spoken around you day in and day out. Have you been listening to the things that the people have been saying to you as you listen to them talk in the coffee shops or out on the streets or you watch the TV or listen to the radio or listen to the politicians, the messages that you were being fed? I wonder if you have noticed that behind many of these messages there is an apparent helplessness, a sense of no direction, a sense of urgency and a lack of purpose. Uh, One of my favorite bands to listen to is called the Fleet Foxes, and they have a song called Helplessness Blues that I think is probably could be deemed the song, the theme song of our day. Uh, In the way that the song goes, the, the band begins by saying, You know, I I was raised to believe that I was something unique and special, but now I'm not so sure anymore. I I want to believe that there's a higher purpose, but I don't know what that higher purpose could be. And there are a lot of mixed messages going around in this world, and I'm not sure that I can trust anyone. I I don't know who to listen to anymore. And probably the most depressing verse is the last verse where they say, if I know only one thing, It's that everything that I see in the world around is so inconceivable, often I barely can speak. Yes, I'm tongue-tied and dizzy, and I can't keep it to myself, but what good is it to sing helplessness blues? Why should I wait for anyone else? We look around the world, the two things that everyone is longing for, we are longing for someone to come along who can show us compassion, in our deepest suffering, and also someone who has the power to truly deliver us from our deepest need and our deepest problem. And when we've exhausted all the options of this world, when we've tried everything and everything seems to come up short, where can we go? Mark points us to the place that we can go in these two stories of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from this text, we see this morning that it is the Lord Jesus who has compassion and power to save us in our sin and in our suffering. Two stories, two different aspects of Jesus. Uh, The one, the compassion of Jesus, And the second, the authority of Jesus to forgive sin. We're going to look at both these these, this morning. First, we get the story of a leper. And in this story, we see the compassion of Jesus in our suffering. I want you to take a look at verse 40 of chapter 1. The story begins by saying, a leper came to him. Now, we read that, we don't think much of it, and it doesn't hold the weight that it would have held for Mark's original readers because we just don't think much about leprosy today or what today we call Hansen's disease. It's not something that we get up in arms about. But in Jesus' day, in the ancient world, leprosy was a deadly disease. And if you contracted this disease, what would happen is this nasty bacterial infection would begin breaking out all over your skin, And as the disease set in more and more, it would render your nervous system obsolete and your extremities would eventually become completely useless. When we read of Luke's account, his gospel, when he talks about this story, Luke is a doctor and he tells us that this man was not just leprous, he was full of leprosy, he says. So this man that we read about, he's not just in the beginning stages of the disease, he is full-blown leprous. If we want to borrow a line from The Princess Bride, the movie, he is not all dead, he's only mostly dead. (laughs) And that is probably how this poor man felt. He's not all dead, but he is really mostly dead. In Jesus' day, it was a death sentence. There was no cure for leprosy or for Hansen's disease, and the, the death sentence was Tri- but ma- had many facets to it. As we have read for us in Leviticus 13, you were doomed to a life of being ostracized. 
If you got leprosy, you had to go around in ragged clothes. You had to go around keeping your appearance looking nasty just so that people's attention would be drawn to you so that they would know to stay away. And if people came near, you had to cover your mouth and say, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. Some of you went through the two-week quarantine in 2020 when you contracted COVID, and you felt, even in that two weeks, the, the loneliness and depression setting in, even in those two weeks. Well, imagine a lifetime permanent quarantine. You're not allowed to be around your family. You're not allowed to be around your friends. You no longer are a part of society. Even worship is something that you are not allowed to to be a part of, a slow and painful disease. So it's shocking when we read that this leper decides to make his way to Jesus. We can imagine the scene, can't we? Somehow or other, the, the ministry and message of Jesus reached the ostracized community of the lepers, and one man, this man who is full of leprosy, is listening, and his heart begins to be moved, and he thinks to himself, this Jesus could be the answer to my healing. And so he makes a radical move, a radical decision. He will go to Jesus. He will risk his own reputation by defying all of the health mandates and the local laws about lepers, and he will make a risky decision in putting Jesus and his disciples at risk of a possibility of a lifetime of uncleanness if his disease gets passed on to them. But his faith is solid. He believes Jesus can heal him. And I want us to look because in what he does in verse 40, I think we see a great example of what true faith in Jesus is. First, we see his faith is desperate. Look at what it says in verse 40. A leper came to him imploring him. He had no other options. The only option he had set before him was Jesus. He was desperate that Jesus would answer his request. Secondly, we see truly true faith in Christ is reverent. It says he kneeled before him. He knew who Jesus was and who he was in comparison, and he kneels in humility before him. But probably most striking, true faith is confident. We see this thing always, the first service, this thing always is nice, and in the second service, this thing is always mean. I don't know why, why this thing isn't working, but true faith is confident, confident. Look at what the leper says. He comes to Jesus and he says to him, if you will, you can make me clean. He does not come to Jesus saying, if you're capable, if you're able to heal me, he comes with full assurance and faith that there is nothing impossible for Jesus to do, that if he can or if he will, he can make him clean. Might I submit to you that every single one of our prayers of faith will sound like that. Coming to Christ, believing that he is capable, believing there is nothing impossible for him. It's not a matter of whether he is able. For us, it's always a matter of if he is willing. The book of James tells us that when we come to Christ and ask him of thing, for things, that we ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. If he, if he is willing, he can. Is Christ willing? What is his response? Jesus does something in verse 41 that probably not only shocked the leper, but shocked the disciples who were watching this unfold. In verse 41, we see that moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Jesus does not just give him his word of willingness, which would have been enough, but he goes even further. He reaches out and he touches this unclean leper, the first touch that this man probably received in the Lord knows how long, the touch of acceptance, the touch of affection, his willingness to make him clean. Why this drastic measure by Jesus? Well, in verse 41, we are told in the beginning what moved Jesus was that he was moved with pity. 
his heart was stirred in compassion for this man. Now, raise your hand again if you have an NIV. All right, you are looking at the text and you're saying, well, that's not what it says. My, my verse 41 says Jesus was indignant, not that he was moved with compassion. Those are two very different things. Jesus being indignant, angry, and Jesus being compassionate, what is going on here? Why the translational difference? Well, uh, certain translations work with certain manuscripts of Mark. And the manuscripts that we have available of Mark, there are discrepancies between whether this verse says moved with pity, which the majority of the manuscripts say, or whether it says he was indignant. Now, we shouldn't get up in arms about this. It doesn't change the meaning of the text at all. If Jesus was angry... He was not angry at the leper, but he was angry at the brokenness of the world that caused this man's suffering, and it moved his heart in compassion towards this man. What we're seeing here in verse 41 is what happens when Jesus looks upon you in your suffering. What happens in his heart when he looks at you, when you come to him in faith, laying out your suffering before him? Two things happen in the heart of Jesus. He gets angry at the brokenness of this world that caused your pain. And he is stirred to compassion for you. It was the theologian B.B. Warfield who wrote a fascinating essay that Crossway just recently republished called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. Uh, B.B. Warfield wanted to answer a question. He said, if we look at all four of the Gospels and we look at all the moments where Jesus emotes, where he is uh, said to, to, to have emotion, what can we learn about the emotional life of Jesus? And here is what he discovered. He starts the book by saying, the emotion we should naturally expect to find most frequently attributed to Jesus is no doubt compassion. Compassion is the emotion that Jesus felt most in the four Gospels. When he looked at the suffering and brokenness of this world, it moved his heart to compassion. And this word is so significant. I'm not normally one to talk about Greek in the pulpit, but I think it helps us to understand just what's going on in the heart of Jesus with compassion. Because the word is a violent sounding word. Here it is. The word for compassion is Splunk nitsomai. Okay? Can you all say that with me? All right? Splunk nitsomai. Well, we got to do it more vigor, more vigor. Splunk nitsomai. You just had your first Greek class. Well done, well done. That word is a violent sounding word because it is a violent meaning. It literally means a twisting of the bowels. You, you think, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if I wanted to tell my wife back in Jesus' day, I love you so much, I wouldn't say, I love you with all my heart. I would say, honey, I love you with all my bowels. <laughs> so we, in our day, we talk about the heart as the seat of the affections, the seat of love. Back in Jesus' day, they thought where the, where the emotions resided was in the bowels, and this word, this twisting of the bowels, it literally, it's a violent stir of affection. It is a violent, almost sick love. It's a desperate love. And what's amazing about this word is if you looked at all of the Greek classics and tried to comb them for this word, you would not find it. It is a word created by the scripture writers it is a word born out of scripture alone and in every place, but I think a couple places, it only is used in reference to how Jesus feels towards suffering. It's a word born out of scripture alone and it's a word born out of the very heart of Christ. There is no love so intense, no feelings so passionate as what Jesus feels for sufferers that it needs a whole new word. And this is what he feels towards you in your suffering. When he looks upon you, no matter how small you think your suffering is or how great, his heart is moved to splunk nitsomai. Intense compassion. Well, this story takes an unfortunate turn. The man is healed. Jesus gives him two stipulations for the healing. Take a look at verse 44. 
Jesus sternly charged him. He's very, he means business when he says this to this man. Verse 44, two things he asks of him. One, see that you say nothing to anyone. Jesus did not want the message of his own message and his identity be misconstrued. He, he didn't want anyone messing with, he wanted to control the narrative in other sense. And he, he knew his time was not yet, so he was protecting his ministry, he was protecting his identity. So he tells the man, do not tell anyone that I did this for you. And number two, go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Though Jesus has the authority to heal, he is not going to bypass the Old Testament law. He upholds God's law. And lepers who were cleansed, as Leviticus teaches, they needed to go to the temple and make sure as, by an examination of the priest that they really were cleansed from their disease. So two things. Number one, he says, obey me. And number two, obey the law. Now, we are told, we're not told whether the man obeyed God's law, but we are told unequivocally that he did not obey Jesus' request to keep it under wraps. Verse 45, what do we see? He went out, began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news. And as a result, Jesus' ministry was drastically affected. He had to change his whole tactic. It says, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. So once it was, I'm going to go to the people, and now because of this one man's disobedience, he has to stay outside and let the people come to him. I think it, it raises a question for us. Is Jesus worthy of our obedience for the affection, for the compassion that he shows us in our lives? Or do we just take it for granted that he is a, a God of love and a God of grace and healing and compassion and uh, we're just indifferent to it and we go and do about our way? Is Jesus worthy of our obedience for the compassion he has shown us? Even when we don't fully understand why he's asking us to do what he's asking us to do, is he worthy of our obedience? We see from the first story the compassion of Jesus in our suffering. And that takes us to the second story. The authority of Jesus to forgive our sin. The authority of Jesus to forgive our sin. Chapter 2, verse 1, we see he's back in Capernaum, his hometown. And we see just like we left him in Capernaum last time, he is... There's a huge crowd. Everyone knows Jesus is at home. Verse 2 tells us many were gathered together. There was not even room at the door, and he was preaching. There's a huge crowd. Now, tip. As we go through the Gospel of Mark, crowds in the Gospel of Mark are never a good thing. Any time that a crowd is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, we are to anticipate that Jesus is going to be misunderstood Jesus is going to be threatened, or Jesus is going to be questioned. And so every time we see a crowd, our mind ought to go, uh-oh. And sure enough, here in verse 3, there is an uh-oh about this crowd. We discover that there is a group of four men who were trying to get a paralytic to Jesus. And verse 4 tells us this crowd would not let them through. So here they are, they're listening to the message of Jesus, but apparently they're not interested in the mission of Jesus because they're not helping this poor man get to Jesus. And so what do the men do? Well, they say, if we can't get through them, we'll go over them. And that's what they do. In verse 4, they climb the house that Jesus is teaching from. They begin to tear away at the roof, the, the thatch, the mud, the dirt. They're peeling everything away. You can imagine as Jesus is teaching and the dirt starts falling on his head, he's confused and everyone's wondering what's going on. And then suddenly a man comes being you know, lowered down into the room. I think it's another lesson in what true faith in Jesus looks like. We learn from the leper, faith is desperate, reverent, and confident. But it is also from these men determined. They were going to do everything they could to get to Jesus. They didn't say to the paralytic, I don't think this is a good time. Uh, we'll, we'll try again tomorrow. He, they, he, they weren't like some people today who say, well, you know, I'm going to figure Jesus out someday. Uh, my calendar's pretty full. I've got a lot going on right now. 
but I do want to, I've always I kind of admired religious people, and I'll get around to it someday. My grandmother was a very religious person. I'd like to be more like her, so someday I'm going to figure Jesus out. No, they were going to get to Jesus no matter what it took. And what was Jesus' response to their faith? Take a look at verse 5. He shocks them again. Verse 5, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. Do you think the paralytic was a little confused? Like, thank you, Jesus, but that's not exactly why I'm here right now. I actually came because I want my legs back. Do you think the crowd was confused? Does Jesus misunderstand this situation? What, is he unable to heal this man? Why, why does he say your sins are forgiven? This man's come for a physical healing. See, what we're seeing is Jesus' compassion is so great towards this paralytic, he doesn't just see his physical need, but he gets even deeper into the man's ultimate need, his spiritual need of healing. He needs his sins to be forgiven. We should not be surprised when Christ uses our physical trials to point out deeper spiritual needs for more dependence upon him. Well, that pesky crowd, they have to start their pesking, and they do. Take a look at verse 6. Some of the scribes were sitting there, the theological know-it-alls of the day, and they begin questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? To which we want to say, exactly. <laughs> Might I submit to you, there's actually two different paralyses that are at work in this story. There is the physical paralysis of this man, but there is also the spiritual paralysis of the scribes. Though they know everything you could know about the scripture, they are so paralyzed spiritually that they cannot see Jesus for who he is. And it's a spiritual paralysis that only Jesus has insight into. Take a look at verse 8. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, the man, the divine king prophesied in Daniel 7 who would be given the entire dominion of God's kingdom, the king who alone has the authority of the kingdom to do whatever he wants, and he alone has the authority to pardon those who offend his authority as the king. And what Jesus is saying is, okay, so if I say to you, your sins are forgiven, I understand you can't test whether that is true or not. You have to take it by faith. But if I say to this paralytic, rise, get up, take your bed and go, and he rises, well, that is verifiable. And if I can do that, then you ought to believe that I also have the power to forgive sin. And so he tells this dear paralytic, I tell you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. What happens? He rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. What was their response that day? Verse 12. They were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. That was the response of the crowd that day. What should our response be this morning? This passage, these two stories, point us to a straightforward application. We must have faith in Jesus, the Son of Man. There are two categories of people here this morning, and only two. You will either fall into one or you'll fall into the other. 
Either this morning you are like one of the scribes and you are stuck in your skepticism when it comes to Jesus. Perhaps you've come here this morning, uh, you think that Jesus was a great teacher, you really admire the things that he taught, maybe you even believe that he had miraculous power. But when it comes to him being the son of man, the Lord whom every man has to deal with, the man who has authority over heaven and earth, uh, you're not so sure. That's the first category. The second category are those like the lepers and the paralytic who are believers. They have absolute faith and trust that Jesus is exactly who he said he is. The question for us this morning is, will we stay in our skepticism or will we receive him by faith? And just like he gave substantial evidence why we should trust him to the crowd that day by healing the paralytic. He has given us an abundance of reasons why we should trust him as the son of God. He does not ask us to check our brains at the door by trusting in him. He has given us so many reasons why it should be the natural response of our hearts and minds to put our full weight down on him as the only Lord and Savior. The pinnacle of which is the fact he is the only one who rose from the dead and conquered the grave. When a man rises from the dead, we take him seriously. Is he the one that you are looking to who has the power alone to raise you from your sin? Because the reality is we have a leprosy and paralysis of our own. It's not a physical one. It is the leprosy and paralysis of sin. Each one of us is infected with it. Each one of us has been given the death sentence because we have rebelled against God. And just like the leper could do nothing to heal himself and like the paralytic could do nothing on his own energy to receive the help he needed, we can do nothing to get ourselves out of our own predicament. How did they receive the deliverance of Christ? Faith alone. It was a faith that was desperate, a faith that was reverent, a faith that was confident, and a faith that was determined. No other options on the table, only Jesus. Knowing that he is Lord and deserves our reference. Knowing that he is powerful and we can be confident that he has all that we need and determined. Nothing sidetracking us from coming to him. Friends, what we see from this text is the Lord Jesus has compassion in our suffering. He asks us to trust the fact that he's not indifferent to us, that the totality of his heart is turned towards us. And when he looks at our world, when he looks at our families, when he looks at us as individuals and he sees the suffering we are enduring, his heart is moved to splunk nitsomai, intense compassion. And we are also called to trust that he alone is the one who has authority and power to save us in our sin and suffering. He doesn't ask us to go through a priest. He doesn't ask us that uh, we have a perfect church record. He doesn't even ask us to uh, trust in something like water baptism as, as the means by which we will be saved. He doesn't ask us to have a perfect track record of life that somehow or other our good deeds at the end of the day uh, outweigh our, our bad deeds and that's how he's going to grade us when we meet him someday. All he asks is faith. Coming to him knowing that we have nothing to contribute to our help but that he alone must be the one who saves us. Today, no matter what suffering you are enduring, Jesus' heart is moved to deep, intense compassion. If you could just experience one moment of the intensity of feeling he has for you in your suffering, you'd never question his love again. He asks you to trust his heart towards you in your suffering. And most importantly, those of you who today stand apart from bowing the knee to his lordship, those of you who remain like the scribes in your skepticism, he says, I want you to know, know confidently that me, the son of man, 
has authority to forgive sins. He is willing. Come to him this morning by faith alone, trusting that he is who he said he is. The Lord Jesus has compassion and power to save us in our sin and suffering. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the person here this morning who is dead in their sin. I pray for the person here this morning who maybe have attended this church for a long time and yet their heart is still hardened towards the realities of who Jesus said he is. And I pray that those individuals here this morning would take seriously the condition they are under according to what your word says. They are dead in their sin. And unless they trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sin and for salvation, they are doomed to eternal punishment. And so I pray for those individuals this morning that they would take seriously the claim of Jesus. He alone has the authority to forgive sins, and it is him with whom we have to deal. And so I pray that they would be moved by the intense compassion and love that Jesus has in his heart for them, and that they would come knowing that not only is he able to save, but he is so willing to save. And for us, Lord, who find ourselves in a season of great suffering, no matter what that suffering may be, whether it is uh, physical or relational or emotional, spiritual, whatever it may be, that we would have true faith to know that Jesus is not indifferent to our suffering. He doesn't roll his eyes at us in our suffering, but his heart is moved to intense passion and love. He cares deeply and that we would place our trust again and the affection that he said that he has for us, and there find all the comfort we need to keep on keeping on. Father, we want to receive all the goodness of Jesus that he has for us. So make us less like the scribes, make us more like the leper and the paralytic as we leave this place, that our full faith and desperate need would be for Jesus and Jesus alone. We pray these things in his name. And all God's people said.